Is it time for a mind shift? If you don't know what that means, then join your host, Dr. Clint Haycock, a former evangelical Christian pastor and Bible college teacher of over 20 years, along the journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of faith, life, religion, and spirituality. I'm speaking today with Brian Stoller. You write a lot on, well, I guess it's an archive website now, the Homeschoolers Anonymous blog, and I've noticed you do a lot of stuff on your own blog. You're a former homeschooler. I'm fascinated to talk to you about not only your backstory, but what you're doing now sort of as an activist. So welcome on to MindShift Podcast. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here. Yeah, I've, I've been friends with you for a long time on Twitter. We've been going back and forth talking about this because I've been researching guys like R.J. Rush Dooney, Dominionism, and that's how I stumbled across the homeschooling connection was I didn't realize that Rush Dooney was so pivotal in starting the movement originally and Christian schools as well. So you came through that movement yourself. What's your backstory? You grew up in a homeschool environment. Yes, I was homeschooled uh, all the way through, as they say, uh, kindergarten through high school graduation. I was homeschooled in California, so uh, in the Bay Area. And my experience was, I would say, pretty chill compared to other people since I was in California. The scene here was pretty, well, I would say liberal at the time, but really it just means moderate. But I think that I really encountered the more fundamentalist side of homeschooling when I got to high school because I started doing uh, homeschool speech and debate and I had the opportunity to tour around the country in a motorhome teaching speech and debate to other homeschool students. Mm -hmm. And while doing that, I started to see just how radical and fundamentalist the homeschooling movement really was. Uh, My horizons really got broadened and my eyes got opened to just how problematic the homeschooling movement is because of the influences of people like Rush Dooney. So what curriculum did you use? Because I noticed a few years ago you had a thread on Twitter where you sort of went through and pulled out a lot of your old homeschooling books and that was fascinating. In fact, I just shared one the other day where I think it was a a Becca or a Bika Mm -hmm. homeschooling book on the history of slavery in America. You know, and it was like, oh, my gosh, the, the slaves didn't have they had it so good. You know, what, what's yes. the problem? I don't <laughs> understand. You know, it was so easy. The climate was wonderful. They easily learned how to pick cotton and they had it really pretty good. And you think, my God, this is standard fare for a lot of the homeschooling curriculum. Absolutely. Yeah. Abeka and Bob Jones are the two most popular curriculums in the evangelical homeschooling movement. And I definitely used that growing up. My family used uh, Becca and Bob Jones, and we used a lot of creationist textbooks for science. I would say, you know, my homeschool experience was generally okay when it came to things like reading and writing. And I also got to do speech and debate, but it was really lacking in math and science. And especially the science part, because Basically, the only science we learned was creationism. Uh, we young, a young earth creationism? A young earth creationism, You're yeah. You're talking like Ken Ham, Answers in Genesis type stuff? Absolutely, yeah. Right. Uh, we used Ken Ham, and we did, you know, studied the, uh, I think, oh, I can't remember the name. But there's, I mean, there's several different creation science institutes, and Ken Ham's, of course, is the most popular, but there's several other ones as well, mm. and we used all of them. And I think definitely that the curriculums are a big source of the problem. The curriculum that are used in homeschooling have a lot of conspiracy theories. There's a lot of historical revisionism, especially when it comes to controversial issues such as slavery, Mm -hmm. where they're going to do a lot of whitewashing of the history. And, you know, it's all this part of this project to groom children to become culture warriors so that they can take back the United States uh, for God's glory. And that 
goes back to Rush Dooney. You know, Rush Dooney's whole vision for homeschooling was one of dominionism. And the whole idea is that you can take children and put them in this parallel society where they're, it's, you know, they're isolated and they have no exposure to alternative viewpoints and they can be you know, inculcated with the values and philosophy of their parents and not be exposed to anything else. Mm-hmm. And that's where, why it gets dangerous because children are so isolated and have no exposure to other people and other ideas. Mm-hmm. Well, and I'm sure we can talk about it at some point. This is another huge issue is because of the privacy maintained by so many homeschooling families, there's a lot of abuses, sexual and physical abuses that don't get reported. And I think there's a lot of articles on the Homeschoolers Anonymous website, isn't there, where mm-hmm. people have told their stories and they don't, the state authorities just don't know about these abuses within these very insular communities. Not all of them are that way, are they? But a lot of them are, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you know, the vast majority of homeschoolers are uh, conservative evangelicals. Uh, I think the most recent statistics we have about that is that 85 to 90 percent of homeschoolers are uh, white evangelicals. So that's definitely the vast majority of them. And the deregulation of homeschooling is a very purposeful and intentional part of this whole project. And that's what creates the situation that you just described where there is so much abuse and neglect. And that's because, you know, homeschoolers believe, most homeschoolers believe that the government has no right to be involved in education. And that goes back to Rush Dooney again mm-hmm. and Christian Reconstructionism and this idea of sphere sovereignty where you know, you have different spheres of power, such as the family, the state, and the church, and those spheres aren't supposed to overlap with each other. And to Christian Reconstructionists, the most important sphere is the family. That's the primary unit of society. And the state and the church aren't supposed to get involved into family affairs. And for most homeschoolers, uh, education is within the sphere of the family. And so there should be no government regulation whatsoever of education in that worldview. Mm -hmm. And so homeschoolers have fought for the last several decades to make sure that their homeschooling is not uh, being regulated by the government. There's no uh, federal oversight whatsoever of homeschooling. Oversight of homeschooling is only on the state level and most states have minimal to no oversight on homeschooling whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of created this wild west where anything goes and people can get away with anything because there's no one looking Mm -hmm. over the homeschoolers to make sure that they're actually giving children an education. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's no, you know, homeschool children rarely interact with mandatory reporters because a lot of homeschoolers keep their family, their children away from mandatory reporters because they're worried that they might get reported for abuse. Right. And we know there's another element to this as well beyond the physical or sexual abuse. There's the whole anti-vax piece as well, isn't there? Have you come yes. across that? Cause this is what I've been researching for this article that I'm trying to write, <laughs> getting there yes. eventually, but this is now, especially in the advent of COVID, a lot of states are considering mandatory COVID vaccinations for all school children. And the one loophole is homeschooling in many, many states, maybe all the states, I don't know. But some states are trying to close that loophole. My God, you talk about an uproar. You know, people are saying, I'm going to homeschool my kids now simply because I won't, I won't have to get them vaccinated for COVID or any other vaccine for that matter. Yeah, we see that a lot and you know i honestly i've seen that here in california a lot too you know even in california where homeschoolers are more liberal there's a very strong anti-vax movement here uh and people will pull their children out of public schools specifically just to keep them from being vaccinated Mm -hmm. and you know the anti-vax movement is very strong among homeschoolers and that's definitely been the case for several decades. I think that's part of the whole like anti-government mentality within homeschooling. And there's also a distrust of professionals and that would involve a distrust of medical professionals. And so there's a lot of suspicion. There's a lot of conspiracy theories too about vaccinations within homeschooling. 
And there's also a lot of peer pressure. I've talked about this before, but my family started out pretty moderate. And as the years went by, when they were getting more and more involved in the homeschooling movement, they started to become increasingly conservative and fundamentalist and in a sense radicalized. Mm -hmm. When I, when I was growing up, my older brother and myself and my younger sister were all within five years of each other. We were all vaccinated. And then we had a much younger brother about a decade later who was born and he was not vaccinated at all. He received no vaccinations. And that's because my parents had become increasingly conservative and started to buy into the whole Mm -hmm. uh, anti-establishment mentality of homeschooling. So yeah, that's, uh, there's a lot of peer pressure among homeschooling adults. Then that leads to the radicalization of homeschoolers really, Mm -hmm. because, you know, most of the leaders uh, in homeschooling are more extremist And so that really just trickles down through the whole power structure of homeschooling so that even people who join homeschooling and they're liberal or moderate, they'll start to absorb all these ideas from the larger culture and start to become more anti-government, you know, more conservative, fundamentalist, all of that. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to know the language. This is something I picked up from reading Julie Ingersoll's book on Christian Reconstructionism. She said that Rush Dooney and Christian Reconstruction, their ideas have just seeped into a lot of mainstream evangelicalism and, like you say, the homeschooling culture. And so you don't actually have to mention his name. What you have to know are key words, key phrases. And when you hear things like government school or God's law word or, you know, theonomy and things like that, you go, aha, that is a Rush Dooney type language. That's his wording. Mm -hmm. His name never comes up because some people say, well, he's too extreme in some of his views. But man, have his, have his ideas percolated all the way throughout, like you say, and a lot of the homeschooling curriculum, they're still studying his Institutes of Biblical Law, his Christian History of America, and on and on and on. His name's all over the, the movement, isn't it? Absolutely. I think uh, Ingersoll's book, Building God's Kingdom, is a fantastic resource. She makes a brilliant observation at one point something along the lines of uh, like little slivers of Rush Dooney's work are found everywhere in homeschooling. And I think that's so true. Uh, a lot of people think that, you know, Rush Dooney's ideas were on the more extreme side. And so they try to distance themselves from him because of that. But at the same time, they really, really like most of what he has to say. Mm -hmm. And really, they just shy away from the parts where he talks about executing, you know, rebellious children and gay people (laughs) for understandable reasons. They would want to distance themselves from that. But but not all do. I mean, some actually embrace that. I mean, Kevin Swanson, who is a, you know, a national homeschooling leader from Colorado. He definitely believes that. Doug Wilson. What's that? Doug Wilson. He's another one out of Moscow, Idaho. Yes, Doug Wilson, absolutely. Uh, I was thinking too, Doug Phillips of Vision Forum. I mean, he's deposed now, isn't he? But he yeah. was pretty much a Reconstructionist, as I understand it, advancing Rush Dooney's ideas down absolutely. there in Texas. And then he had a big scandal and he had to step down. The whole thing fell apart. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the ideas are shot through the movement. Well, you mentioned this idea of taking dominion. This is a thing that kind of, I think, originates with Rush Dooney. One of the first, if not the first, to actually come up with a formulated system of what it would look like. And as I understand it, that's why he was so passionate about homeschooling, wasn't it? That the idea that the best way for Christians to achieve dominion is to raise generations and generations of children raised with this biblical worldview, which you hear a lot. That's another classic one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Education has to have a biblical worldview or it's not any good. (laughs) What's going to happen though? if they get enough, because this is part of the quiverful movement. You got to have big families too, don't you? Mm-hmm. You got to yes. have a lot of kids to eventually, so you're in the Duggar sort of camp and you got to take over the world eventually. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you are, the the end goal is to take over the world. Hmm. Uh, and I, we actually talked about a lot about how, you know, dominionism and Christian nationalism and all within the context of the United States and this idea of, Uh, taking the United States back for God's glory. But there's also a very strong international element to this as well, where, 
you know, American conservatives are exporting the culture wars, they're exporting homeschooling around the world, and homeschooling has become now this uh, major cause for global conservatives. And so homeschooling has now become not just a way to take back the United States for God's glory, but it's, it's really taken on this international aspect of redeeming the entire world for God's glory. Yeah, I think that, you know, Rush Dooney is really key to that. And, you know, the idea of Christian reconstructionism is that you take children out of the government schools. That's what he Rush Dooney calls public schools. And you put them in this isolated parallel culture and you give them all, all you give, give them alternatives to all the aspects of popular culture. So you have you know, evangelical magazines, you have evangelical music, you have evangelical summer camps, mm. evangelical school curricula, all, yeah. all these create different, a bubble. yeah, you create a, the perfect bubble and yeah. you keep children isolated in that culture and make sure that they understand the correct presuppositions about how to understand the world. And so by the time they get to college or even Still, they could stay within the bubble in college if they went somewhere like Patrick Henry College, which is a college for homeschool graduates. And so children could not be exposed to alternative viewpoints from, you know, the moment they're born all the way through graduating from college. And now they're the perfect, you know, culture warriors. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, I was going to say we got to get to Patrick Henry College. But the way to get there, I think, is to talk about Michael Ferris. Because he's the guy, he founds Patrick Henry College, but before that he was way more adv- involved in homeschooling, wasn't he? Because from what I've read about him, he founded the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, the HSLDA, in about mm-hmm. 1983, so very many decades ago. He himself was a homeschooling dad, I think, in California at the time, uh, maybe or maybe Washington State. He comes Washington. out of my home state, Washington, yeah. actually. So what can you tell us about Michael Ferris? He's another huge figure in this whole homeschooling uh, situation. Yeah, Michael Ferris is one of the four pillars of homeschooling. These and all the pillars of homeschooling are white evangelicals. So you have Michael Ferris, you have Brian Ray, who's the most well-known homeschool researcher. You have Mary Pride, who is the person that really kind of started the Quiverful movement. Mm -hmm. And then you have Greg Harris, who is the father of Joshua Harris, who wrote I Kiss yeah. Dating Goodbye. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Michael Ferris, uh, he started the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and that's the main lobbying organization for homeschoolers in the United States. It's the organization that has successfully deregulated homeschooling in all 50 states. So what the Homeschool Legal Defense Association is, it's basically like an insurance company So homeschool families pay a monthly dues to HSLDA. Uh, That homeschool family ever encounters a problem with, say, like the CPS, the child protective system, or social workers, then homeschoolers can call HSLDA and they will defend them in court. And so Michael Ferris created this now massive organization that makes sure that in all the states that homeschooling stays as unregulated as possible. And that's because Michael Ferris is a Christian reconstructionist, just like Rush Dooney. Ferris is not as extreme as Rush Dooney, so he would disavow ideas like stoning rebellious kids and gay people. But Ferris is still very much a believer in Christian reconstructionism. He believes that the government has you know, no right to be involved in education. He believes in dominionism. He believes in the quiverful stuff, having as many kids as possible. And he believes in a parallel society for evangelical children. Um, and that's why he created Patrick Henry College was, you know, he saw this problem of all these evangelical kids, you know, they're raised in the perfect system and then they go to college and then they lose their faith. And that's this great tragedy that gets repeated year after year, you know, you know, homeschool parents or evangelical parents in general, really, they always share the statistics about how many kids lose their faith in college and that stirs them up and makes them more inspired to, you know, brainwash harder and harder. 
uh, instead of actually reassessing right. uh, maybe, maybe a there's problem a problem you are doing. <laughs> yeah, so, maybe there's a reason uh, for this, the, walking away from her faith, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so yeah, keep uh, them in the pipeline. You can keep them in that bubble for another three or four years. Send them to Patrick Henry College. Exactly. I read yeah. somewhere something like 85 to 90% of the actual student body of Patrick Henry are homeschool kids. So the vast majority of them are homeschoolers. Yes, yeah, the college was specifically created for homeschoolers. And they certainly have some people that attend that are not just homeschoolers now. But yeah, that was definitely the purpose of that. And yeah, the best there, are other, and there are other colleges like that too. I mean, Doug Wilson, you know, he created uh, New St. Andrews in Moscow, Idaho. Mm -hmm. And that's also a school that's primarily attended by homeschool graduates. The school I went to for my undergrad Gutenberg College in Eugene, Oregon. That's also a primarily homeschool graduate college. So there, yeah, there's quite a few of them. And definitely the purpose is to keep kids, you know, in the worldview and the system as long as possible. Right. And the thing about Patrick Henry that's fascinating is that because it's located so close to Washington, D.C., isn't it, that their aim is to get uh, current students involved in politics and the legal field they want to, they, and they have, they, they've placed a lot of interns in the White House all the way back to the Bush era, as mm -hmm. well as the Trump era. They've got students that are in uh, Supreme Court justices' uh, offices as interns, obviously working for politi conservative politicians. Uh, and I yeah. think, again, that's that dominionist pipeline, isn't it? You get these, these college kids involved as interns, and it's like they're w literally walking in the corridors of power and then mm -hmm. a lot of them go on to, to law school. Because the thing is, these guys are incredibly bright, aren't they? I mean, they talk about there's a lot of Patrick Henry students that have perfect SAT scores, literally ace the mm -hmm. test. So these guys, these men and women are incredibly intelligent. There's no question about that. But then what are they doing with this? What's the aim of their education at Patrick Henry? Exactly. Yeah. They, they're incredibly intelligent and they're, you know, they're, they are incredibly well trained too. I mean, they do what they do very, very well. Sure. And yeah, we definitely, I mean, there's, there is a, pi a, a Patrick Henry college to the White House pipeline. Right. And that was seen most prominently during the Trump administration. And we're also seeing, you know, that Patrick Henry has this pipeline to government positions in general, Madison Cawthorn, uh, who's a current U U.S. representative. Mm -hmm. He is a Patrick Henry College alum, and he has a whole, all sorts of problems. He does, he, yeah. He has been accused of sexual harassment and assault by all sorts of people from Patrick mm -hmm. Henry. That um, story's kind of gone away now, hasn't it? But it has, yeah. I think Which he was only was there for one semester, though. You, you know, he wasn't there long term, was he? But he certainly was, he was a homeschool kid as, as a sort of, a, that was his pipeline to Patrick yeah. Henry, wasn't it? So he comes out it, of that world. Yeah, yeah. And actually what's interesting about the fact that he was only at Patrick Henry for a very short amount of time is that he had so many accusations of harassment and assault yeah. for only being there for like a month Wasn't or so. Wasn't there that long. Yeah. yeah, so that shows, you, max. that shows you there's definitely something problematic going on there. Mm -hmm. And Patrick Henry, of course, doesn't have a very good record itself of dealing with uh, sexual harassment and assault. It was, I think, probably about five years ago, there was an article by uh, Kiara Feldman in, I think it was the New Republic. There was an expose on how Patrick Henry has failed to handle a lot of cases of assault and harassment on their campus in a proper way. Yeah, it was a deeply patriarchal, modesty culture sort of college, isn't it? I read that book, God's Harvard by Hannah mm -hmm. Rosen, which I'm sure you've read as well, but it's yeah. fascinating, isn't it? Because she was basically embedded on the campus for, it sounds like months and months and months. I mean, they let her sit in classes and talk to students, talk to professors. She would walk into Michael Ferris's office when he was the active president of the college mm -hmm. and just sit down and have a chat with him and try to figure out where he was coming from, you know, theologically, yeah. philosophically. It's a fascinating book on that college. If people have not read uh, God's Harvard, I would highly recommend it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, and, you know, we were talking about, you know, homeschoolers trying to avoid government regulation. And I think that also extends to these colleges as well, because a lot of these colleges, well, all of the ones that I just mentioned, Patrick Henry, New St. Andrews, Gutenberg, 
And then there's a whole bunch of other ones, these evangelical schools that are wanting to avoid government regulations as well. And so they don't take, you know, taxpayer money, which means they don't have to submit to, for example, Title IX. Mm-hmm. And so when you have these cases of sexual assault and harassment, these colleges aren't under any obligation to follow the actual best practices that other schools follow. Mm-hmm. And so that's why you have so many cases where people that have been assaulted, you know, their cases have been so horribly mishandled. Yeah, I just swept saw the, the I think it was down. yesterday or the day before, there was this, an expose on Liberty University. That was a horrific report on how they've mishandled assault on campus. And they're actually, Liberty actually takes taxpayer money now. So they actually are under Title IX. Mm-hmm. But all these other schools, there's no record keeping or reports whatsoever. So. Yep. It's well, it's created a perfect worse, culture, though. hasn't it? I mean, it's mm-hmm. like the expose on the Southern Baptist Convention that was done, I think, in the Houston Chronicle a few years ago, some 700 churches across the country. And all this has been coming up lately with the letter that was leaked by uh, Russell Moore. Leaked, I should mm-hmm. say, in, in air quotes. I'm not sure if he was intending to leak it or what, but you know, it was kind of like, guys, we are really screwing this up. We've got a horrific culture. And you put the modesty piece in there. I think it creates uh, a culture where abusers know they can get away with abusing boys, girls, whoever, adults, mm-hmm. and they're probably not going to suffer any or very many consequences at all. You see that right across the board, it seems like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's the same thing. And like we were saying, in homes, a lot of homeschooling families, if you've got a, a culture that's privatized and you know that there won't be any state oversight, what's to stop a father from abusing his child, whether it's physically, sexually, emotionally, and you're not going to get found out? You know, it's created a huge problem. Yes, there's a lot of articles on the Homeschoolers Anonymous website if people want to read about these experiences. When we come back from the break with Ryan Stoller, we're going to be getting into this Homeschoolers Anonymous blog. Why is it archived? There's some really interesting stuff going on there. And then talking about what Ryan is currently into as well as the global expansion of the homeschooling network, the efforts by the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, the HSLDA, and what their designs are to spread their beliefs literally worldwide. So there's some really concerning stuff going on. And what's interesting too is that we mentioned the four pillars of the Christian homeschooling movement. One of those names was Greg Harris. And of course, Josh Harris is his son. And he wrote the famous book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. He himself was a homeschooler. He graduated from that movement. Like I say, his dad was a huge towering figure, probably still is, I guess, in many ways, Greg Harris. But what's really interesting is that I've been talking about the Christianity Today podcast on Mars Hill and Mark Driscoll in Seattle. And speaking of which, if you haven't caught the episode that I did recently with Dr. Warren Throckmorton on this, you definitely need to catch that. We go into a lot more detail, I think, than the Christianity Today podcast does. And of course... If you've been listening to that series, then you'll know they did kind of a special bonus episode just with Josh Harris about his book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, and some of the other things. There's been a lot of stuff that's been coming out recently, and I've still been thinking when I get a little bit of time, I want to do an episode on this, especially now as more and more information is coming out about Mike Cosper, who, of course, is the host of the Christianity Today podcast about Martell and Mark Driscoll. But I've been uncovering some really interesting, kind of disturbing stuff about Cosper, he has a long-standing relationship with Acts 29, the church, the network that he helped plant out of Louisville, Kentucky, called the Sojourn Network, which is now renamed, rebranded itself, the Harbor Network. They've got some really quite disturbing connections with C.J. Mahaney of Sovereign Grace Ministries, as well as the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is there in Louisville. A lot of the people that are staff members or were staff members at Sojourn or now Harbor were part of the SBTS, and of course that's a connection to the Southern Baptist Convention, which has hugely problematic issues. And what I've been uncovering in my research is that there's a lot of connections between the Mars Hill sort of toxic theology and the model of the church that Mars Hill had versus Sojourn when it first started, even though they don't have a celebrity person like a Mark Driscoll, there's a lot of parallels. And one of the things about their Christianity Today series is, of course, Mike Cosper is not delving into any of this. And of course, if you listen to the Josh Harris one, I thought it was really kind of condescending. There was a lot of sermonizing at the end. He did a lot of talking. He wasn't really listening to Harris. And so there's a lot of concerning stuff. 
definitely coming from an evangelical perspective, sort of this thing like, well, Jesus isn't done with you yet, Josh. So there's a lot of stuff that needs to be talked about. It needs to be delved into, especially around this Christianity Today series, what's going on, especially from my own perspective as an ex-evangelical who came out of movements like that. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. So I'm going to try to put an, an episode together. But what's coming up here in the next few episodes? Well, I've got Kurt Anderson lined up for another interview. This time it's about his book, Evil Geniuses. We're going to do that recording next week as I'm doing this recording now. That's already booked in. So I'm talking to him. I'm also going to be talking to David Madison. For those of you that are unfamiliar with his name, he was actually on this show a few years back. And Tim Sledge, who's a good friend of mine, he wrote, of course, Goodbye Jesus. He messaged me and said that he's been editing this book that David Madison is just about to come out with. In fact, it's available now on Amazon. You can get it as a Kindle version or a regular book. It's called 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Hadn't Taught and Other Reasons to Question His Words. And I've just bought the book on Kindle, so I'm really interested to go through it in preparation with my talk with David Madison about this book that, as I say, it's just come out now. So really looking forward to talking to David. And then what's coming up in terms of the MindShift Zoom calls, we're going to be resuming those in the month of September. We've got David Johnson, who was on the show a little bit ago. He's going to be the first guest. I've also asked Kurt Anderson if he would be willing to come back. Also, I'm going to be talking to Frank Schaefer, both as a standalone podcast, and he's also going to come in as our MindShift Zoom call guest in the month of August. So some fantastic stuff coming up. Also, I wanted to give a huge thank you to Nora Tomlin, to Tiffany Aeneas and Michael McKay. They are the newest supporters of the show on Patreon, and they've been added into our Closed Mindship Podcast Facebook group, so it's really cool to get to know these people and then be a part of our Mindship Zoom calls. And in fact, I forgot to mention, we just did one last Saturday as I'm doing this recording, talking with Frank Schaefer. This, again, was something only available for people that support the show on Patreon, but we talked about Frank's brand new book that hasn't even come out yet, but we were able to get advanced copies. We all read the book. We had about an hour, almost an hour and a half conversation with Frank. It's absolutely fantastic. That is going to come out before his book drops. So look for that Zoom call with Frank Schaefer coming out. But yes, thank you to the latest Patreon supporters of the show. Really, really appreciate it. So thank you so much for your support. All right, let's get on back into the conversation with Ryan Stoller as we continue to examine this issue of taking dominion inside the Christian homeschooling bubble. Now that website is archived, isn't it? It's no longer active. Is that right? Correct. So why is that? Uh, I mean, honestly, it just got so overwhelming to have to process and shepherd so many stories of such horrific abuse and neglect. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was able to do that for several years and then it just got overwhelming at, at some point. Kind of burned um, out. Yeah, just got burned out. And I think that we had, when we were running that project, we had this goal or hope that sharing these stories would actually change homeschoolers' minds. Mm-hmm. Um, which was optimistic, um, but I have come to see is like a misplaced optimism. I don't think that the homeschooling movement is actually going to change their ways just from hearing stories. And, you know, that's it's a sad thing. It's heartbreaking to me and so upsetting, but I think that's just the reality. I think that You know, you were talking about the SBC and uh, Krista Brown, who's kind of one of the, she's like the the godmother of the SBC survivor movement. And she wrote an article a few months ago saying that, you know, really when it comes to the SBC, the secular authorities have to intervene. There's there's not not going to be efficient change from within. And I think that's so true. And I think that's true about homeschoolers as well. I don't think that they are going to change their ways on their own. I think that secular authorities are going to have to get involved. And I think that if there is going to be a wake up call for homeschoolers, it's going to be something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. 
that's just the reality of it. But like the reality, said, and yeah, and and again, it's it's upsetting because it should be enough to know that hundreds and thousands of children have been so harmed, and the movement isn't even willing to do non-regulatory solutions like maybe some public awareness campaigns or some summits on child abuse prevention awareness, simple steps, those aren't even done. So yeah, I can't even do that yeah. simple thing to regulate themselves. So like say, if, if it means the state authorities are going to have to get involved, but of course that's where we circle around to organizations like the HSLDA, they've got so much power. And now Michael Ferris is the head of the ADF, the Alliance yes. Defending Freedom, which is, I think mm -hmm. the biggest Christian legal organization in America. They've got a massive budget. As powerful as the HSLDA is, the ADF will also step in too to defend the rights of homeschooling parents and all the rest of it. And I think a lot of states, I don't know what your perspective on it, they're really leery of getting involved. They don't want to get mm -hmm. involved because there's such a potential backlash. They could be sued. They could find themselves in court in a second with the HSLDA on their, on their backs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, HSLDA is very uh, tenacious and intense when it comes to their responses. They yeah. like really know how to like whip up their their constituents and kind of sick them on whoever they mm -hmm. want to take down. And they can get thousands and thousands of homeschooling parents to send emails, you know, on the drop of a dime. And that can be really overwhelming to, you know, legislators who are trying to pass some basic safeguards for homeschooling, you know, they think, oh, maybe we should require homeschool kids to see someone outside their family maybe once a year, you know, not get too crazy, minimal. Yeah. something very minimal. And then, Start. you know, then they get all of a sudden thousands of emails from homeschoolers saying this is tyranny. Right. And they're, they're like, oh, wow, we didn't know this was such a touchy issue. And then they back off. And that just, yeah. that yeah. happens over and over and again. And that's why we haven't been able to get any safeguards for homeschool kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they will literally wow. flood their offices, won't they? Mm -hmm. Phone calls, emails. I guess they don't do faxes anymore, do they? But yeah. it used to be but faxes as well. <laughs> yeah. day, yeah. It was a literal tidal wave of outraged parents calling and faxing and emailing and everything else. Their local senator, legislator, congressperson, whoever it was. Yeah, and it's a, it's a hot button topic and they're going to back off. This is their constituency after all. And then they could they could take it all the way to the Supreme Court, which they have done on on some occasions, haven't they? But mm -hmm. it all goes back to Rush Dooney. I mean, he was the guy that I mean, they even claimed that Rush Dooney, because of his legal activism, he was going state to state to state arguing for the rights of homeschool parents back in the 70s and 80s. It was from him that guys like Mike Ferris got the idea that we need a homeschool legal defense association. Mm -hmm. So again, we trace it back to Rush Dooney, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. You start to see those little slivers of Rush Dooney everywhere. There it is, another yeah, sliver. Yeah, yeah. You also have large families, and so you can take those all your kids to the state legislature as a field trip for homeschooling mm. and count it as Civics education. trip. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you bring all your kids with you, maybe 5 to 20, depending on how cloverful you are. Is. And you yeah. eventually have, you know, hundreds of people showing up in support of homeschooling and you don't see anyone on the other side and you think, okay, well, that seems to be working just fine. Yeah, we got and numbers. you don't realize that, you know, that family might have several older kids who are now alienated and super struggling with life. But the homeschoolers don't care about that because you have so many other children. I mean, and that's part of the point of having these large families. Michael Ferris talks about what he calls a farm system where basically you have as many homeschool kids as possible and if you lose a few that's okay but because as long as you get a few of them to reach the top and to get the power then you're doing okay right it's a numbers it's, game it's a numbers game for them right. yeah if you have 12 kids and three of them become senators or politicians or lawyers or something they made it to the top i guess the other eight or nine well you know that's mm -hmm. the statistic purely a statistics racket isn't it it is, yeah. That's a chilling vision, though, isn't it? I don't want to be thought of as just a number, a statistic, you know, of a homeschool quiverful family. Yeah, I mean, and they, you know, they refer to them as as arrows, and that's when you think about it, it's, it's very dehumanizing. It's you mm -hmm. know, yeah, we're not 
our parents' weapons. Like, yeah, if you it. shoot enough arrows, some of them are going to hit the mark. Basically, a lot mm -hmm. of them are going to fall by the wayside, but a few of them are going to hit the target, and that's a win. Well, what would yeah. this society look like? I mean, we, we talk about Rush Dooney's vision of imposing Old Testament law on society and all the rest of it. What do they want? You know, what, let's just say they, they win. Let's say the Quiverful families win. They take over. There's, they're, they're running the show. What does it look like? What sort of a society are they going to create? Is it a theocracy or what? It is a theocracy. I mean, they, they want the United States to be redeemed for God's glory, and they want it to be a Christian nation. It, it, it's a little complicated because a lot of Christian Reconstructionists are libertarians mm -hmm. in addition to being theocrats. And so they're not imagining a totalitarian state. Yeah, like a handmade We often see in like the whole hands made tail idea. Yeah. But, but there are aspects of that that are absolutely correct. And that's, you know, when it comes to enforcing what they see as uh, biblical morality. And that's why you have these kind of more extreme versions of, you know, stoning rebellious children, stoning gay people. But then you have the more liberal versions of it where gay people are just thrown in jail, you know. They're not executed but, then. Yeah, they're not. Oh, yeah, you're just going to go to jail, that's all. <laughs> uh, so Christian Reconstructionists do imagine a theocracy, but it's also one where people are free to, well, I don't I want to say people, white people, white evangelicals and white men are free to do what they want with their property, basically. Right. And yeah. the property rights are really important part of yeah, um, huge. Christian Reconstructionism. And of course, a lot of people that support Christian Reconstructionism, you know, see property as including children or, you know, women or people of color even. So yeah. And that's where you get the really nasty parts of it. A lot of threads seem to come together, don't they? Like you say, or slivers. I was just researching a group. I don't know if you've heard of them called Mamalitia. They're out of Stockton, California. They were originally called the Freedom Angels. And they came to prominence in 2019 when uh, they, they were picketing in the Sacramento of the ca capital of California, uh, trying to stop students from being vaccinated after the SB 277 law was passed. Oh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Now these group, there's a women's group. They are a homeschooling uh, co-op sort of group, but they're like survivalists. So they're training with guns or training on first aid. They think the end is going to come. And they're this group out of Stockton. I mean, it's all the pieces <laughs> just like you just described. The weird thing is it's, a, it's an all female group, you know, mm -hmm. so you can get all kinds in this sort of movement, can't you? Oh yeah, absolutely. And there's definitely something attractive to a lot of people about this movement. And I think that it gives people a sense of control, really. And I think for a lot of homeschooling parents, that sense of control uh, gives them a lot of comfort. Um, I think that a lot of homeschooling parents grew up in families where they felt like, you know, family itself was not valued. And so they're trying to swing in the other direction and they've just gone, you know, way too far. Way too far. Yeah. Well, how much of this is, does the homesteading movement feature into this whole thing? Because one of the shows that I started, it's like a guilty pleasure. I started watching the Rainies, the oh, Homestead yeah. <laughs> Rescue. Now I like the show cause I'm a construction guy. I'm, I'm a carpenter by trade and I'm interested to see how they go in and try to help these struggling families. But one thing I started noticing is that the values of these sort of homesteaders, a lot of them are homeschoolers. They're living off the grid. They're out in the middle of nowhere. And yeah, I'm thinking, wait, they never really talk about their beliefs on the show, but I'm thinking this has got to be part of what we're talking about here. There's this sort of libertarian land owning, living off the grid, self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And that includes, you've got a homeschool because you're living a hundred miles from the nearest town as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's interesting because you also have a lot of overlap there with actually liberal and progressive people mm -hmm. who are wanting to, you know, they have this similar anti-establishment mentality, except for them, the establishment is, you know, a lot of like conservative white power stuff. Yeah, and so they're trying to escape from that. But at the same time, that causes them to also be suspicious of, you know, the government and maybe medical establishment 
th those sorts of things. And so you have a lot of overlap between the like liberal and progressive, well, homeschoolers really, I mean, because a lot of liberals and progressive do homeschool. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, evangelical fundamentalist homeschoolers because of that. Yeah, there's a lot out there. Well, what are you doing now? Because you say you're not involved with the Homeschoolers Anonymous uh, blog anymore. But I notice on your site, you do a lot of writing. I just read an article the other day, you were talking about the G-H-E-X, which is a whole yes. nother thing. You know, so you're still doing a lot of activism in terms of like raising people's awareness of what's going on. Yeah, G-H-E-X. Uh, yeah, I wrote, an, I wrote a, a report on my blog. It's at rlstoller.wordpress.com. And the report's called How Homeschoolers Plan to Take Over the World. And uh, GHEX is a international organization that was founded by HSLDA. Basically, it's the, the international HSLDA. So mm -hmm. they are it's a bunch of uh, American and European homeschool activists and apologists, and they are trying to spread homeschooling around the world. And not just homeschooling, but very specifically, the American libertarian version of homeschooling, this deregulated homeschooling where parental rights are absolute. And so GHEX is doing a lot of activism and they're doing a lot of their own research, I'd call it activist research, to make sh to promote homeschooling in countries where there's a strong uh, conservative presence. And so that's especially the case in Russia and Brazil right now. They're mm -hmm. pushing really hard for those countries to not only legalize homeschooling, but legalize homeschooling in a hands-off way. Yeah, they have a um, very specific vision, don't they? Like yeah. You say, it's this anti-government, hands-off sort of thing. They're trying, yeah. they are exporting it. It's starting to come over here to this country. I mean, homeschooling in the UK is not that big of a deal, but it's, I think it's growing. I'm yeah. seeing a few people over here that have had experiences of homeschooling in the United Kingdom. So it is something that's happening, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, as, as far as what I'm, I'm up to, I'm working on uh, a couple of books, actually. I'm working on a book on homeschooling, uh, specifically evangelical homeschooling, and it trying to answer the question of why is there so much abuse and neglect in this movement? You know, is our children falling through the cracks or is all this abuse and neglect really by design? And spoiler alert, and my argument is, is that it's the second and that's because, you know, homeschoolers want this deregulated regime uh, because they believe that parental rights are absolute and that children do not have rights. And then the other book I'm working on is a theology book, interestingly, uh, because it's interesting because I'm not personally very religious. I consider myself an apatheist now. Uh, but I still find liberation theology very interesting and stimulating. And I find it actually very healing to see how, you know, biblical texts that were used to hurt and harm me and my friends being used instead to liberate and empower kids. So I'm working on a, another book about child liberation theology. Liberation theology is, you know, there's a lot of different versions of it. Uh, there's black liberation theology, there's queer liberation theology, there's uh, womanist liberation theology, but there's never really been a child liberation theology. Uh, and so I thought that would be a really interesting to, thing to explore. And yeah, I've been loving it. And so I'm working on a book, I call it The Kingdom of Children. Mm -hmm. And Essentially, it's, it's a, a practical guide for faith communities to figure out how they can better lift up and empower and protect children in their midst and mm. use the Bible in a way that is productive rather than destructive. Mm. They both sound like fascinating projects, for sure. I was thinking when you were talking about the first one, we were going along with this homeschooling thing. When it comes out, let's talk again, though. We could talk about your other one, too, because I'm fascinated by theology as well, even though I'm not a Christian anymore. And I, like you said, I'm not very religious at all, but yeah. I'm still, I still know how to read theology. I talk about theology a lot. Um, that's why I think, okay, guys like you and me, we read Rush Dooney and other people. We know what the language is, don't we? Because that's our mm -hmm. background. So it's very helpful. 
to uh, to be able to understand what these guys are talking about. It is, and that's I think that's so important in trying to educate the broader public about these issues, and, and also why it's so hard, difficult to educate the broader public mm-hmm. is there's so there's so much that goes into this. There's, this world is so insular, and they have so many different organizations which are all like led by the exact same people. So they're really just a whole bunch of shell organizations. And then there's so many leaders and there's acronyms. There's so many acronyms. And it's really hard to like keep track of everything and figure out all the associations. You know, at some point you do start to feel like a conspiracy theorist that you're making all these connections, but they're all all literally there and they're not really hiding it. It's just, they're, they're really good at organization. That's, that's something that I like to, point out as often as I can is that the religious right, their, their superpower is organization. And that's why they've been so successful. It really is. I think that's, that's something I think that us progressives really need to uh, learn from them and work on is figuring out how we can be just as organized so that we can actually counter them effectively. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. That's why I love the work of Catherine Stewart, for example. I think she does a great job of that sort of, inve- she brings that investigative journalist mind to this task, whether it's the Good News Club or the Power Worshippers, and she just starts connecting the dots. I wonder sometimes, does she have a big wall, you know, in her house that's yeah. <laughs> out of the perfect mind where it's all this red thread and pins uh-huh, and uh-huh. You know, clippings of newspapers? How do you keep track of it all? But like you say, what you find is you see the same names popping yes. up over and over. When I was researching Dominion Theology and Seven Mountains Mandate and all that, I was finding the same names. These people serve on boards of other organizations. And you go, ah, I know that person. I've seen her over here. Now I've got a connection. There cannot be a coincidence here, as you say, but it's doing the field work. That's the hard part, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The the Power Worshippers by Catherine Stewart was an absolutely amazing book. And the last chapter in particular on the global conservative movement was uh, really, really good. And that's actually uh, the next, her next book is going to be on the global conservative movement. So Mm. I think that's a really important thing to start paying attention to. And I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of people talking about it. And I'm, I'm hopeful about that because the conservatives in the United States have been exporting the culture wars for several decades and a lot, they've been doing that under the radar most of the time. Like I mentioned in my article about the Global Home Education Exchange, which the international HSLDA, like they don't even have a Wiki, Wikipedia page. Mm-hmm. Um, so same yeah, with like AD, uh, the Alliance, uh, the ADF, they have the EDF, which is the European version, yeah. and they don't even have a Wikipedia, Wikipedia page. Yeah, I think the more attention we can and the more light we can shine on how these everything we're talking about is now being exported internationally, the better, because I think they're doing a real conservatives are doing a really good job at exporting those. And that's mm-hmm. honestly terrifying to me. It is. How well, they're doing it. well, and another plug, obviously good books are Jeff Charlotte's the family and C street, which he does mm-hmm. basically that same thing, isn't it? It's like when yeah. he starts putting the pieces together, when I saw that series on Netflix, I was just like, Oh my God, I had no idea that this dominionism stuff runs this deep. That's really what got me started was watching that series on Netflix a few years ago. And I, I heard the name RJ Rush Dooney and C Peter Wagner and some of these people like that. I started going in, reading their books, reading their articles. And that's what's led me down this rabbit trail. So in a way it's led me to you. So I'm yeah. glad we met. <laughs> we can thank Rush Dooney. Okay. No, should we thank Rush Dooney? Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, last question then, how can people find you on social media? What's the best place? You mentioned your blog. Do you want to say that again? And then how can people find you like on Twitter or other places? Yeah, Uh, my blog is R.L. Stoller and Stoller is S-T-O-L-L-A-R. And then it's .wordpress.com. And then I'm on Twitter at R.L. Stoller as well. And then if you're interested in uh, child liberation theology, you can also just find that on both Facebook and Twitter, just by look, searching for child liberation theology. I have uh, Facebook pages on both of that. Mm-hmm. And then you can also, uh, even though the Homeschoolers Anonymous uh, website is archived, the Homeschoolers Anonymous Facebook page is still active. They share uh, just any recent homeschool news and then, 
they share like old articles and all that. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about homeschooling and what's going on with the politics and the culture, you can stay connected through that Facebook page. It's a good resource, isn't it? Because I, I think I'm a member of that group on Facebook and I've, I've asked questions before and just thrown things out there and say, can you, can you guys help me with this? Cause I don't come out of the homeschool community myself, but in mm -hmm. the work and research I've done, that's been a huge resource just for me to say, can you help me with and point me in the right direction? Like this thing of the anti-vax and all the homeschooling. I'm trying to find more and more research and more information. So it is out there, isn't it? It's just finding the right networks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, if you go to that Facebook page and just like, if there's something that you have a question about and you just ask on an, any of the posts, there's usually a lot of people that are willing to interact and help out. Yeah, it's pretty there's also if for people who are homeschooled and are looking for wanting to connect with other homeschool alumni and get help and things are struggling with, uh, there is a subreddit on Reddit that is called homeschool recovery. And they have about almost like 8,000 people in that subreddit. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of people there. And that's uh, also a great resource, both for uh, homeschool alumni and then also people who are, have questions about homeschooling. Mm. Um, so if you're uh, a reporter or an analyst trying to, you know, get some more like personal stories from people, that's also a great resource. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, thank you so much for the resources. I hope people will go find the uh, social media stuff, the Reddit, subreddit, good resources out there. Listen, Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Thank you for your work and your activism, and we will definitely be speaking again. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to the future conversations.